years in town. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. I know. I didn't. I guess I was earlier. I could see. Yeah. 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 Well, sorry, uh, I have uh, not. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm just going to Oh, okay. Might be on my That'd be fine. Just making a note here so when I see it. Okay, I get to chair the meeting again. <laughs> so we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Great to great to see everyone. Um, there's some uh, great green in the room. I see different shades of green, so folks are in the spirit. But you have to definitely check out Dr. Dave's tie. I would highly recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, Shane, you've got a pretty uh, snappy tie on as well for St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so, Shane, I'll turn to you uh, to um, establish our quorum. Uh, looks like we do have a few folks missing, so I'll do roll call. Um, Dr. Box? Here. Dr. Monroe? Here. Senator Kenley? Here. Dr. Maxey? Here. Carl Ellison? Mr. Tabor? Here. Dr. Veal? Here. Ms. Irwin? Here. Ms. Waldron? Here. Dr. Halverson? Dr. Kane? Dr. Welsh? Present. Commissioner Bardsley? Present. Mayor Courtney? Commissioner Dawes? Here. Congresswoman Brooks? Here. We do have a quorum. Thank you. So uh, for today, we're going to have a, a really critically important topic uh, to be discussed. And I know uh, in speaking to some of the members before, I know folks are excited about this particular topic. So I suspect we'll have a robust uh, discussion. Um, I became state health officer in 2005. And I can remember my first week on the job, I was introduced to the pandemic preparedness planning that the state was doing along with other states, all the states across the United States because of the concern about an avian influenza that could have a very high mortality rate. And so that was the, uh, the work of the day and got very involved in that. And then it was August 29th, 2005, that Hurricane Katrina uh, devastated New Orleans. That's when it, it uh, uh, land, landed and uh, began that journey. And I will tell you, I, that was another huge introduction for me in terms of not just preparedness, but the response. And uh, I, I remember being very proud of Indiana uh, and uh, our uh, uh, reserve uh, and Homeland Security, the National Guard uh, did an outstanding job uh, responding and helping uh, victims uh, in, in Mississippi. And then of course, Indiana, uh, we were a host state and had uh, several, I don't know how many, I don't know, 1800 or something. I, I think I, I read a number of people came here. Um, so the, the, uh, when we think about the importance of emergency preparedness, uh, we've certainly seen that importance in uh, public health and disease outbreaks such as Ebola, Zika, COVID-19, um, and even going back to H1N1 when I was state health officer uh, in uh, 2008 and 2009. Um, so there's so much more though than tabletop exercises when we talk about preparedness uh, and uh, re pandemic response plans or responding to the crisis of the day. Um, it's really about consistent investment and innovation. Um, and it requires anticipating those events and training for those and keeping up to date on the training uh, for those while at the same time working to prevent their occurrence. Um, so without emergency preparedness, communities uh, would be at risk of greater consequences uh, when the disasters uh, does uh, strike and um, the health of, of uh, our state would suffer, uh, let alone uh, longer term economic uh, stability and, and resiliency. So. Uh, really super important topic today. Um, I'm personally very uh, excited to hear the presentation. Uh, but before we uh, do that, I'd like to uh, turn to Senator Kinley for opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Monroe. Um, Shane's gonna outline for you where we're gonna be going in the next couple of months. And we're kind of wrapping up our educational cycle here of learning about all these different areas. And uh, the next couple of months are going to be pretty intense at our meetings in terms of making decisions and looking at reports. And so uh, we appreciate your patience, but we think it's important to cover all the groundwork 
uh, before we get to it. Dr. Box and I have continued to have Zoom meetings with different organizations. Um, uh, we don't want to have a false hope, but I think we're getting pretty good receptions at where we're going. I think all this will pay off and, and the listening tours have gone well too. I, I've only been to one. I'm going to Monticello tomorrow and I went to Seymour uh, a few weeks ago and it was really pretty beneficial and we're giving people a good chance to participate. And uh, so uh, I feel good about where we are and what we're doing. Uh, that is not to uh, minimize the sensitivity of the subject that we're dealing with overall and the fact that there's going to be uh, resistance in some ways, but uh, I'm pretty confident that we're on the right path. I think uh, the, the topic that we're going to talk about today, the emergency preparedness, you know, part of the what we've established with the uh, Indiana's fiscally sound identity is, is that we kind of plan for the future and work ahead on things and that fits right in and probably we're going to find out that by investing in emergency preparedness now we'll be helping build a better safer tomorrow for all our Hoosiers so um, I appreciate your continued perseverance uh, you're getting near the point where you can really speak out in in a strong way in the next month or two and uh, so thanks to everybody for your efforts so far Thank you. Um, Dr. Box. Thanks, Dr. Monroe. You know, it's really timely that we're talking emergency preparedness today because this is Indiana's severe weather preparedness week. Tornadoes, of course, which a lot of parts of our country don't really suffer from or have, but you know, every Friday at 11 a.m., you can hear the sirens going off, at least where I live. Um, but you know, we also respond to floods. We've done that since I've been at the State Department of Health and earthquakes, thank God we haven't had that one other disease outbreaks, and of course, pandemics. I think that being prepared means that we've got to have the infrastructure in place, the training in place for individuals, the partnerships, the critical partnerships that we realized were so important throughout this pandemic and the funding. I, I made sure that each of you got a copy of this. This is called the Trust for America's Health. And it is a group of individuals that look at how states are prepared to address disease, disasters, and, and basically bioterrorism. Indiana fared well in a couple of areas, like um, we have only 1% of our population drinking unsafe water. I was surprised that there was higher percentages out there across the nation. Um, and we became public um, board accredited during the pandemic, believe it or not. So that, that's a big plus. But we lag significantly in others. Um, even in public health funding, our public health funding in the past year had gone up 3%. And let me just say, they didn't look at any of the pandemic stuff. All of the pandemic stuff was backed out of this. Your response to the pandemic was not looked at here. But nationally, that increase was 5% across the United States. So we were still below that. But I think one thing we ranked the lowest in the nation on, and I think it speaks to why we exist as a commission. And that is, they looked at the percent of the population in the United States that is covered by a comprehensive public health system. They surveyed the public, local public health and said, out of these 20 basic foundational services and, and programs, how many do you or your partners that you work with provide? Nationally, 45% of the population is covered by a comprehensive public health system. In the state of Indiana, we were dead last at 25%. So I think it speaks to why we exist, why we're here, what we're trying to do, and, and what our major goal is to accomplish. And all of you, I hope, have a copy of this with you. I think it's clear when you rank the lowest in the nation on something that it's something that needs to be addressed. And I think, again, it reinforces what we're doing. I think most importantly, it addresses the significant disparities that exist in the delivery of these public health services across our state and why we are making it such a goal of ours that we are going to eliminate or at least remove as many of those disparities as we can. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Dr. Box. Yeah, very, very timely for the report to come out and uh, really driving home the importance of the commission. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Brooks, if I could turn to you for opening remarks. Well, very briefly, I uh, want to thank uh, Indiana uh, Department of Homeland Security for coming and presenting today. Um, most people probably don't realize that until 9-11, we didn't have 
Departments of Homeland Security. We didn't have Departments of Homeland Security at the national level or at the state level. I happen to have been US attorney at the time, uh, right after 9-11, and all of these things were stood up 20 years ago. Um, and so it's been quite uh, an evolution um, nationally, US Department of Homeland Security still trying to find its way in many ways. Um, but I'm really proud of our Indiana Department of Homeland Security. I was part of the first CTAS, counterterrorism, I forget what all that acronym stood for, <laughs> anti-terrorism security task force. Um, but I think that we have to realize that the citizens of the state expect emergency preparedness. They just expect it. And they don't really realize that all of our emergency preparedness aren't just paid personnel, they're volunteers too whether it's volunteer fire departments, whether it's volunteer folks um, who are uh, part of citizen groups, CERT teams, uh, you know, neighbors who train to help, um, help us come together in times of emergency, all the types of emergencies that have been outlined before. So just wanna thank them for coming. Uh, I, I think the communication piece for the, those of us who lived in Hamilton County and who were awakened uh, about a week ago for the tornado warning, when it went off, I'm like, this is working, mm -hmm. it's working. It came through my phone that there was a tornado warning a county way. And I thought, wow, we have come a long way, um, but we still have a long way to go. And just really um, pleased that we're focusing on this as part of public health because the citizens expect it. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, and so now we uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes. Yes. Motion to accept. Thank you. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So approved. Um, so next on our agenda, I'm going to turn to uh, Shane uh, Hatchett. And Shane, uh, if you'll discuss the public comment uh, summary and the synopsis of everything we've heard from the public. Thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, past month, of, um, <clears throat> we received 59 public comments. 43 of those were um, what appeared to be form-like in response, but had similar uh, uh, you know, data points, um, focusing really around allowing medical providers to be uh, the point of contact for uh, the patient uh, relationship and giving medical guidance, as well as allowing parents to make decisions regarding their children's health. So really focusing on that personal autonomy piece. We also heard a significant uh, amount uh, related to data collection and in particular electronic medical records. Uh, so it does seem like that's a, an emerging area of interest. There were five folks who were uh, provided comment in relation to favoring an increase on cigarette taxes, uh, especially as a way to improve public health as well as funding for public health. Three folks uh, provided comment related to public health funding and increasing that without specifically related to tobacco taxes. We also had three folks responding uh, on the topic of mental health. Two of those were related to how the pandemic has affected childhood and adolescent mental health, especially due to masks and uh, school closures. <laughs> Uh, and one individual felt that uh, there was a lot more work to be done in developing the mental health system in Indiana uh, and across the country, uh, particularly around funding. Two individuals uh, commented on adolescent and childhood health, uh, which of course we heard on that topic last month. Uh, one was in thanks for us covering that topic and the other was relative to the importance of maternal child health uh, and how really getting those um, uh, community members engaged with folks uh, who are pregnant uh, early on can be a way of uh, ensuring success, in, both uh, through pregnancy and raising children. Uh, and then the other uh, three comments, uh, one was related to vaccine mandates and mask mandates in opposition to that. Uh, and the other two um, were related to uh, remote work for state employees and the importance of EMS as first responders. Very good, thank you. Any any comments uh, regarding the public comment? I will just add that um, as, as a couple of folks have alluded to in our listening tours, uh, tomorrow will be the fifth of seven, I believe. Um, and uh, we've, uh, let's see, attended um, Newcastle, Jasper, Seymour and Huntington. Uh, so we still have Whiting, 
um, Plainfield, and then um, Monticello is tomorrow. Um, by and large, I think we've had a pretty diverse group of individuals coming to those. We intend to, with our partners at HMA, kind of synopsize some of those themes, not necessarily in a fully qualitative uh, study rigor fashion, but to at least identify some emergent themes for folks, as well as who are the types of individuals that were attending those so that we have uh, the ability to, you know, really quantify the different types of folks and, and populations across Indiana that we've impacted um, when we kick these off. And I, I think most of you have been to one already. We really emphasize the importance of these as a way of getting input from individuals outside of the metro Indianapolis area. And I think um, we've done a pretty good job of uh, getting different uh, folks to those uh, events. Um, the last couple have been really well attended, um, as well as getting folks who, you know, both are in favor of the work that we're doing, but also, you know, critical, and they have some thoughts about that too. So it, it is pretty, I think, balanced perspective um, at those hearings. Thank you, thank you. So I know uh, everyone's anxious to uh, move to recommendations in our process for, for our next few meetings and how we're going to uh, uh, work on our recommendations to, to move toward the report for the commission. So Shane, I'd like to call upon you again to walk us through uh, the proposed uh, uh, method for, for accomplishing our mission here. Sure. And I've got just a couple slides here uh, to kind of walk us through uh, what we're, we're planning on. Um, so as you know, today is the last work stream that we have yet to cover. Uh, so once we get through emergency preparedness, uh, all of our work streams will have been gone through in terms of the background information and, and making sure that folks are up to speed on kind of where the emergent issues are. And we'll have had enough time to identify uh, some recommendations and bring that together. So while uh, between me, the, when the original presentations occurred and, and these upcoming meetings, our uh, policy advisors have been working diligently to put together uh, some recommendations and background information. We plan in April to cover the governance and infrastructure, data and information integration and workforce work streams. So we'll have the policy advisors uh, here to share that information and just a very brief, um, you know, almost kind of thesis coverage of uh, a thesis statement rather uh, of what the issue was and why, why we are studying this topic. Um, and then have uh, recommendations in a pretty succinct format We'll continue to provide those materials to you in advance as we've been doing with the other uh, materials we're sending out. So we'll try to give you as much lead time as possible to really digest that and, and come prepared. Um, but it is really going to be pretty important to make sure that you kind of rehash those materials uh, from those meetings. And of course, they're all available on the website if for some reason you may not have your written materials still. Um, and uh, really be prepared to have some in-depth conversations. So, you know, I know a lot of uh, the meetings we've had to date have really been kind of almost half and half in terms of discussion time. We're gonna really allot a significant portion for discussion at these meetings. And we are hoping to be able to drive towards consensus and, and that folks feel, you know, maybe not necessarily 100% good on every single recommendation, but close enough that we can move forward uh, and maybe tweak some things along the way to, to refine it and get it better. So the plan is that at these uh, two meetings in April and May, um, we'll have a presentation of a work stream, the recommendations, and then discussion on those recommendations, and then conclude uh, that work stream with a vote on all of the recommendations in total, uh, with maybe some directions on areas for continued improvement or refinement uh, to move forward as we uh, continue to put together our uh, uh, draft reports that we'll bring to you ideally in June. Uh, it'll be a similar format for May as well. Um, and so once we've adopted those recommendations or we've kind of at least uh, gotten to a place of feeling comfortable to move forward, we'll then bring up the next work stream and uh, continue in that fashion. Uh, because we want to make sure we have enough time to cover all of this information uh, and really not limit the discussion artificially, we are planning to extend the meetings for the next two months uh, by an extra hour. So we will adjourn at 4 p.m. Um, I know this is a little bit of a last minute change for some of you folks, um, but we'll um, uh, try to work with you as needed if, if uh, there need to be some uh, uh, modifications. 
Um, the goal for our final meeting, and, and uh, Congresswoman Brooks reminded me of this, we actually shifted the June date uh, by a week because of some conflicts. So June 23rd is our, our meeting, uh, at least right now, uh, our final meeting. And the idea or goal for that meeting is for us to be able to uh, take a look at that draft report and uh, come together as a group, make any final suggested edits and modifications, do any perfunctory cleanup work, and then essentially adopt it. And then that concludes the uh, at least formal portion of this commission, uh, the way that the executive order was written. Uh, we have until the end of the year to adopt a report or uh, uh, upon adoption of the report, that's when this group dissolves. Um, so after that adoption, staff will take over the, uh, which is really me, uh, <laughs> staff will take over uh, putting the final touches on and making sure that it gets submitted to the right places, posted to the website and so forth. Uh, and of course, we'll uh, continue to work with the governor's office in terms of uh, what sort of legislation gets drafted and put forward for legislative consideration in the 2023 session. Uh, and uh, I do have a note up there that if for some reason we're not able to really in April and May get through everything that we need to, and we still find ourselves in June having some uh, items to um, uh, wrap up, we will schedule a July meeting. And by my count, it looks like July 21st would be the third Thursday of that month but uh, we are really driving towards not needing that meeting. So it'll be imperative that you know, everyone kind of prepares for these upcoming meetings, uh, come with questions and make sure that you know, we're having ongoing dialogue. Um, this is really kind of that one point for folks to be heard and make sure that um, uh, the product that comes out of this is reflective of you know, all of our work together. Um, so you know, it's not really gonna be a, well, I need to go back and confer with folks. The idea is that you will do those uh, in sort of conferring with individuals prior to the meeting and be able to you know, represent um, your, your respective areas. So happy to answer any questions. Dr. Box, did I cover everything? You did a good job. Thanks. Questions from anybody else though? Any questions? All right, thank you, Shane. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we are going to move now to our presentation. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, Stephen Cox, the Executive Director of the Indiana Department of Homeland Security uh, to present on prepare emergency preparedness. Uh, Dr. Cox has been the Executive Director at IDHS since uh, 2020, just before the pandemic. And prior to that, he was the uh, State Fire Marshal. Uh, he is originally from the South Bend area uh, where uh, he worked in local fire protection and understands the needs of the first responders and emergency management very well. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Monroe and uh, members of the commission. Thank you very much for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Um, as Dr. Monroe mentioned, uh, I'm from South Bend, uh, spent 27 years on the fire department there, not just in the fire service side, but also working on the EMS side, was a paramedic for over 25 years, uh, an EMS educator and a, a chief of EMS uh, for the fire department in South Bend as well. So as you might imagine, the fire service and EMS are very near and dear to my heart in spite of the position I hold right now. Uh, but uh, fire and EMS reside within the Indiana Department of Homeland Security as well. So. Additionally, I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce two other individuals that are here with me in the event folks have uh, questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, first, uh, Director of Emergency Preparedness for the Indiana Department of Health, Megan Weidel. Who I might add, many of you probably already know and is an absolute superstar in the state of Indiana and uh, through, through the COVID pandemic has been an amazing partner to Pretty much everybody, right, Dr. Box? I, mean, I would agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, additionally, uh, I have with me uh, Dr. Michael Kaufman, who is the Indiana uh, mm -hmm. Medical Director for EMS. <laughs> Dr. Kaufman is a practicing emergency uh, physician as well, um, and uh, he basically he works for us at the Indiana Department of Homeland Security as our medical director. Uh, providing uh, medical direction for EMS services throughout the state of Indiana. 
uh, and helps us with policy and legislative issues as well pertaining to EMS. Before I get started with the presentation, though, I just want to point something out. Uh, Dr. Box and Dr. Monroe both pointed out uh, the need for training and the identification of, of problems that, that, that exist. And the fire service in 1972 uh, did a study uh, because there's, there was a, a plethora of fire deaths happening all over the United States. They came out with a white paper in 1972 called America's Burning. And there were all kinds of recommendations that were made at that time in order for us to address uh, the, more or less a pandemic of sorts of fire deaths throughout the United States and ways in which we might be able to mitigate that. Very much like what we're doing here, I think, today. Um, and through that process, recommendations were made, and many of you probably remember, I, I'm sure Shane does, I know, uh, when I talked to Mayor Pete, when he became the mayor in South Bend, and I was the fire chief, uh, we had a, um, a, a fire training trailer for little kids to go through, and uh, we were retiring it, and at the time he was 29 years old, and I was, well, I was in my 40s, but uh, we were, we got a brand new trailer and he mentioned to me right in that, in that moment, he said, I remember being in fourth grade, going through that trailer and learning <laughs> fire safety and everything. And the reason I bring that up is that the fire service did such a good job in training people, educating them about fire safety, advancing building codes and things to the point where right now, uh, we have such small fire volume in the United States that it created a, an unintended consequence that we had to pick up training in order for our, the folks to remain competent in fighting fire to, to make sure that firefighters don't get hurt when they do their job. Um, and currently we're, we're going through a process of building out a training system uh, in a, a statewide training academy for firefighters right now as we speak because of that. But the reason I bring that up is we're going to talk a lot about that in this in this presentation about training, exercising, and planning. Because in the end, emergency preparedness involves all of those things. And if you don't do those things, you're not going to be ready for that next disaster emergency that, that occurs. So um, I know you all have, I believe you all have a set of the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation here. So post 9-11, uh, the federal government uh, rolled out initiatives to prepare for disasters uh, through multiple disciplines. And those are examples of those different disciplines would be health, fire, EMS, law enforcement. And with different, different programs created due to the variety of incidents and creating a need to adapt in response to those situations when they occur. Uh, I was just mentioning to Pam while Dr. Monroe was basically mentioning every single one of these things on my slide that she stole my thunder a little bit, no offense. <laughs> uh, but but it, it, the point is, is that every one of these things resulted in a disaster situation and each one of them required somewhat of an ad, a, a adaptation to how we responded and what we did to mitigate that, that problem. And we, we don't even have COVID on there. So, I mean, that, <laughs> that in and of itself was, was probably above and beyond everything that we listed here. So it's, it's really important that we realize that as we prepare and we train for disasters in a general sense, we have to understand how we adapt to things as they change. H1N1 was a perfect example. I know uh, as EMS chief in South Bend, as Dr. Monroe mentioned, we had countywide, uh, a countywide committee that all day long, or uh, you know, like monthly we got together and we were preparing for it and everything. And we felt extremely prepared for that when it, when it occurred. Um, so with any disaster, they all start and end on the local level, typically outside of COVID, of course, right? <laughs> um, and so um, the, the local folks are always the ones that are providing that response and, and, and uh, support through mitigation and recovery throughout the uh, duration of the emergency situation. But the federal government and the state government also uh, have, have uh, are participants in this, and they have a role. In the federal context, typically speaking, in emergency response, they're primarily, they're pri primarily responsible for providing uh, funding to provide for exercise training and, and that type of thing. 
So we pointed out on here that the CDC provides through the Public uh, Health Emergency Preparedness uh, Cooperative, it's an agreement, it's a critical source of funding for state, local and territorial public health departments. And since 2002, the, the PHEP cooperative agreements provided assistance to public health departments across the United States. And it helps health departments build and strengthen their abilities to effectively respond to a range of public health threats, including infectious diseases, natural disasters, and biological, chemical, nuclear, and radiological events. And then the preparedness activities that are funded by that cooperative uh, agreement, they specifically target the development of emergency ready public health departments that are fle flexible and adaptable. Additionally, ASPR provides the Hospital Preparedness Program or HPP, which provides leadership and funding through cooperative agreements to states, territories, and eligible major metropolitan areas to increase the ability of HPP funding recipients to plan for and respond to large scale emergencies and disasters. So these are two major grant uh, opportunities that the state receives federal funding uh, to be able to uh, prepare for and mitigate uh, disaster responses. The Indiana, if I can shift over to the Indiana Department of Homeland Security, we are, we are the state agency that, that basically is a pass through for any FEMA grants or FEMA uh, um, uh, reimbursement programs uh, associated with disasters. Um, and a couple of examples of those are the EMPG grant program which is a funding mechanism by which we go ahead and supply money for emergency management uh, in the counties, specifically state Homeland Security uh, program or SHSP is another grant program that, that funds uh, anything with a terrorism nexus or that type. Um, the public assistance program through FEMA is incredibly important right now in that, in, well, in, typ in, in a typical disaster situation, uh, that we would come out with members of FEMA if there was a declared disaster, and we would go ahead and um, uh, do damage assessments, identify the needs in, of, of different um, uh, locales, and then go ahead and submit to FEMA for public assistance money to help mitigate the cost of, uh, of the damages that have been done. Um, uh, in, in COVID, so since COVID started, uh, since uh, the beginning of uh, 2020, the state of Indiana has received uh, uh, or has, has been obligated over $72 million so far for that one disaster. We've also had entities within the state of Indiana, be it uh, local, state uh, agencies, uh, or otherwise, or organizations that have applied for reimbursement for an additional over $185 million that we're still waiting for FEMA to mitigate, or not mitigate, but to uh, uh, administer. The individual assistance program is another program that FEMA uh, provides reimbursement for in the, the, the two prime programs that I can give examples for that right now with the COVID situation are um, the funeral assistance program. So if you've lost a loved one, you can get up to $8,000 uh, in funeral assistance uh, for burial costs, et cetera, or things that are associated with the death. And then the other uh, individual assistance program, uh, those of you uh, that watch TV anymore on, and see the commercials and whatnot probably have seen the commercials for the 211 with the mental health uh, um, resources available through the state. That is also an individual assistance program that was funded through FEMA. We requested it uh, from the state pretty early on in, in the COVID a disaster and we received uh, federal assistance for that program through the uh, IA. Now, if we move to the state context or the state uh, programming, so the state, as I mentioned a minute ago, is, is actually a pass-through for a lot of the federal programs in, in regards to funding to get money over to the locals in, in response uh, and to, in preparedness and training and exercise. So uh, this is just a, a really quick overview of the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. I oftentimes when I present to folks about what IDHS is, we talk about the fact that emer we have an emergency management and preparedness section, which the state emergency operations center resides there. We support first responders and communities and, and we exercise in plan with local emergency management uh, directors in, in the counties 
and the districts uh, in their DPCs uh, or their district planning councils. Um, also within IDHS, the state uh, fire marshal's office and fire and building safety uh, commission is located within our agency. And uh, so the building, state building commissioner resides within that section as well. Um, the, the probably the most pertinent piece to that in what I was speaking of, of Dr. Kaufman's uh, position within our agency resides within the emergency medical services section that reports up through the fi state fire marshal's office. We also have multiple different boards associated with the agency. Um, this is really quick. We, uh, we have connections with county and regional uh, DHS partners. On the county level, it's typically the emergency management directors within each individual county. And there are 10 district planning councils or 10, uh, or 10 uh, districts that are laid out within the state of Indiana. We'll speak to the districts in, in just a little bit. Uh, because that is a pertinent uh, point that we'd like to make today. Um, emergent, as it pertains to emergency medical services, we often talk about EMS being the front line to the healthcare system safety net. Oftentimes when an individual is lacking of resources, they don't have insurance, they may not have a primary care provider. What do they do when they have an emergency or even not so much an emergency, but they need some sort of healthcare service? They oftentimes call 911. And uh, we're seeing that happen more and more and more frequently as we move forward. Um, and so one of the points that I wanted to make sure that I, I pointed to here is that EMS is in trouble nationwide uh, for a couple of different reasons. One of them is funding. However, uh, one of the biggest problems associated with EMS is that call volume is going up, right? And the graph to the right of, of the slide shows that in 2018, in Indiana, emergency ambulances responded to roughly 750,000 calls for service. Just four years later, in 2021, it was over one and a quarter million responses in the state of Indiana, right? So during that period of time, we only have about 331 operating uh, agents. We actually have 331 agencies that operate ambulances in the state, right? So, um, uh, however, uh, just two years ago, there were over 2,000 ambulances that were making those calls. We're down to about almost uh, 1,800 at this point, only two years later. There are only about 23,000 emergency medical personnel, and that includes only about 4,000 paramedics uh, and roughly 14,000 uh, EMTs in the state of Indiana. And so that's a very small pool of folks responding to these calls. Um, we have 10 training and certification districts. And if we look at the map there, it's the exact same map that the Indiana Department of Health uses for their health districts, which again, I'll speak to in just a little bit. We've had a lot of conversation centering on the Indiana trauma care system. EMS is a central piece to this, but <laughs> If we, look at, uh, if we look at the coverage, right, in the state of Indiana, leading causes of death for Hoosiers uh, under the age of 45 is trauma. And so if it, in the state of Indiana, about 92% of Hoosiers have access to a trauma center within 45 minutes. If you look at the map on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, all of the areas in red designate an area in which those individuals, if you were to have a traumatic event, you live within about 45 minutes of a, a trauma center somewhere in the state. Now, that 92% number is a little bit misleading for the simple fact that you look at the different swaths of white on the, on the map, and those are larger geographical areas that have significant risk associated with them that do not have access to a, to a trauma center within 45 minutes outside of perhaps uh, you know, a life flight or something along those lines responding. Um, it, though, any of you that, that traveled up here from maybe Clarksville or down from the region probably drove through one of those white areas on an interstate where we continually have major accidents and, and major trauma happening out there in, in areas that are not populated and far away from a trauma center. We've also added on this slide the amount of uh, uh, level one, two, and three trauma centers that exist in, in the state. Um, and uh, I would say that's not a, a ridiculously large number of trauma centers that, that exist, right? 
Could I ask? Yes, sir. Well, um, actually, um, no. I, I would, to be frank with you, it was Shane and I talked about this at the beginning. <laughs> would it be okay if I got through the presentation? Because right. we were anticipating a Q&A a right. session afterwards. All right. All right. Okay. Um, I want to speak to the Indiana Department of Health Division of Emergency Preparedness. So not only does IDHS have uh, divisions of planning and preparedness, Indiana Department of Health does as well. Megan heads up that section. So there are four sections uh, within this uh, uh, section of, of uh, Department of Health, and it's uh, district and local readiness, the logistics section, planning and preparedness, and mobile response. So um, we'll talk about those different uh, response efforts in just a few minutes. Uh, but the district and local readiness section basically coordinates uh, either with local health departments or the healthcare coalitions in the districts. They're all, they're, uh, the HCCs are actually provided uh, leadership and representation within the districts to, to plan and exercise and train. The logistics section, as you might imagine, they identify and procure preparedness and response assets. Uh, like I mentioned uh, earlier, Megan's team, uh, this was uh, I, how they did the work that they did over the last two years, I don't know, because these guys were working 24 hours a day with limited staff traveling all over the state. And uh, we had other state agencies helping them do their job, but they were fantastic. And uh, obviously they, they coordinate resources and maintain and deploy assets within the state. Whoop. Uh, I, I actually wanna go back to that real quick. They also administer emergency systems. I think I heard in one of the other meetings that the commission held uh, that you all talked about EM resource, perhaps it was Dr. Weaver's presentation. Uh, also the EM resource when, when it was deployed during COVID was a huge asset to Megan's team to be able to have situational awareness of where uh, assets were and where needs were and everything to be able to deploy what they had. Sorry, I, this thing is moving forward on me. Um, and then of course the, the planning and preparedness and then the mobile response sections, um, the planning and preparedness division does just that. They, they do planning, training and exercise for the agency. And then the mobile response division, again, uh, they have mobile uh, 10, I think 10, 10 mobile units that have been basically operating uh, every day for the last year and a half or so, maybe even a little bit longer than that going out and doing mobile vaccination and testing all around the state, especially in areas that didn't have those resources and oftentimes coordinating with uh, larger mass vaccination or testing sites. Um, so this is uh, a couple of things that the, the DEP uh, have for resourcing. As you all probably well know at the beginning of COVID, the national strategic stockpile basically ran out of everything. <laughs> Uh, we worked very hard uh, as a state to acquire uh, additional resources, be it PPE or other, other needs, ventilators and things from the federal government directly or funding for it. Um, uh, the state has continued to acquire additional equipment to put it in our own stockpile for future needs. And Dr. Box's team is actually working on processes by which the state can have some resources here uh, in the event of a, a future incident as well. They also have mobile hospital and rapid inflatable shelters, um, and mobile command unit, and some other uh, mobile uh, units uh, available to them. I wanted to talk about scalability for a moment because it's really important. Um, I know a focus right now, I mean, none of us can help but have a focus on COVID for the time being, um, but it's important to remember that before COVID hit, it wasn't always just a nationwide pandemic that we responded to. And so it's important for us to keep that in mind that it had, you know, the responses or the training, the preparedness, the exercising has to be scalable to events anywhere and any size. Um, so uh, we pointed out the Scott County HIV outbreak from 2014 that extended into 2015. Um, which also ended up being a uh, uh, governor declared public health emergency. There were approximately 20, 215 or so HIV positive patients that were actually attributed to this particular outbreak. And there were a lot of lessons learned. Community uh, buy-in was essential. 
uh, need for law enforcement engagement. So in other words, engagement with other outside agencies that you might not necessarily work with all the time, Tr building trust with the users uh, because of that law enforcement issue. And then uh, an essential piece to this was treatment and uh, uh, along with mental health and addiction services on the back end to be able to, to have a successful uh, finish to this. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic response was nationwide. It was worldwide and is still somewhat ongoing. Uh, so Indiana's response helped over 3.6 million Hoosiers get vaccinated, tested over 5 million Hoosiers and counting, uh, distributed over 40 million pieces of PPE. Can I just go back to that again? 40 million pieces of PPE throughout the state. Um, uh, over 770,000 testing supplies, held mass testing and vaccination sites at IMS, Gary Roosevelt, the old Gary Roosevelt uh, uh, High School, the University of Notre Dame, Ivy Tech in the southern part of the state, and then several other locations throughout the state. Um, and uh, I, I have to say, there wasn't a day that went by that there wasn't something going on out in with, you know, somewhere in the state. Um, so obviously the challenges associated with this particular event were the unique scope and the size of it, supply scarcity, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, and then evolving guidance that changed rapidly and regularly, not just, uh, I, won't, I won't pick on health folks on that. Uh, I would say FEMA, just in the reimbursement process alone, Dr. Box and I have had like, what, 50 different conversations along the way of changing guidelines on what was going to be reimbursed by schools for disinfection alone, just that one item. That guidance has changed uh, by FEMA probably four or five times through the course of the pandemic. It's, it's, it's been very difficult for agencies and then locals to have a full understanding of what they're even eligible for and when um, and so that for our recovery team, that's been very difficult to, to mitigate as well. Um, and of course, uh, needs for testing and contact tracing. Um, and, and I feel like the state did a fantastic job with that in the way we uh, engage FSSA in health, both uh, were at the forefront of that. Um, with, as with any emergency situation or disaster situation, an after action review should be held. That's actually a part of the planning process. And that the purpose of that is to be able to assess the strengths throughout the disaster or the emergency or to identify areas in which you can improve uh, the response. And so um, ultimately the, the State Department of Health right now is actually in the process of creating an after action review. They contracted with a company which is an outside company to go ahead and evaluate how the response has gone. A couple of the strengths already, I, I know the, the report isn't ready just yet, but uh, some of the things initially that were pointed out are that the, the staff worked relentlessly, which I can absolutely confirm. Uh, and uh, uh, outstanding guidance was provided to folks throughout the state. Uh, and the ability to learn and adapt over the course of the pandemic, like I mentioned, guideline changes continually happening uh, was a big deal. Um, and I think having worked in the emergency services for my entire career and taken part in a million after action reviews, communication is, is typically at the top of the list of things that can be improved upon. Um, I would uh, also say that uh, I would say that Dr. Box and her team did an unbelievable job at communicating. That's not to say that we can't take uh, more active measures to be able to uh, expand what, what happened. Uh, the call center at IDOH uh, and then better training. Uh, again, these are gonna be typical um, points. All right, considerations for improvement. The, this, is, this is what I really would love to focus on here. Um, enhanced connectivity to our constituents. Um, it, this is, it, there are a couple of different ways in which we feel that, that this could be uh, provided. Number one is to explore additional technologies for us to be able to communicate. Like I mentioned just a minute ago, Dr. Box's team did a phenomenal job of communicating with folks in the state. Having said that, mm -hmm. I think expectations outside of maybe state government or whatever, 
were different from what was being provided. And I would also say that in, an, in a disaster situation, it's not always possible to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks. And I think sometimes that actually leads to some of that uh, problematic conversation with, um, uh, with folks. Uh, so uh, exploring additional technologies to communicate, better targeting demographic groups, utilizing better data. So in other words, we went through a lot of processes uh, in um, how we addressed or communicated with particular demographic groups, whether it be young versus old, whether it be different ethnic groups, whether it be rural and, and urban, there were different ways in which we provided information to folks. Um, and uh, so that's another thing that, that we'd like to better manage or target. And better managing and anticipating how information is received and interpreted, right? I have four 20-somethings and all of them receive their information much differently than I do. Um, in fact, I, well, I won't go into how, what they call me and things like that when I can't figure out how to work things on my cell phone. But um, I, I imagine I'm not alone in the room, so I'm not going to look at anybody right now on that. So, um, And then utilizing partnerships to share consistent information as well. Um, enhancing integration and coordination. This was something that we found specifically through the pandemic. It was very important for us to be able to create public and private partnerships to mitigate problems as they, as, as they came up. But it's also really important for us to be able to get buy-in from our partners throughout the state. And sometimes that creates a big challenge just based on who you're speaking to and how you uh, get that buy-in. Um, we, uh, in multiple situations, had conversations with folks in rural hospitals, at the same time having uh, similar conversations with folks in um, urban medical centers, and the information or the buy-in was completely different because of the difference in, in needs of everybody. Uh, and it wasn't just hospitals. I, 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 Brian, I don't want to get, just get on the hospitals. It was, you know, EMS agencies, every local health departments, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we want to point out here is at the executive level, it's really important that we have greater buy-in and participation at the executive level, because sometimes the folks that are uh, on the front lines doing the work are, don't feel empowered to be able to make decisions and do the things that they need to do if the executive level uh, folks are not uh, brought into the mix. Um, we'd also like to reconsider the current Indiana Department of Health uh, uh, district boundaries and roles and responsibilities. Um, a couple of things that, that we've spoken about a lot. Um, number one, the district, so the flow of patients uh, in the state uh, with the different healthcare systems don't naturally or organically flow with the way the districts are actually set up, number one. Number two, if you look at Howard County as a prime example, Shane, I don't know if this thing has a pointer. It does. Okay, so if, if you all can see where Howard County is up there or on your map uh, there, Kokomo is literally sits within a couple of miles of District 3 and District 4, yet they train and exercise in District 6. In the majority of the municipalities or the, 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 the folks that they would normally train with are further to the, much further to the east in District 6. So when the tornado hit Howard County about two years ago, three years ago, um, the, the mutual aid that came to assist the people in Kokomo didn't come out of District 6. So um, that's been something that's been brought up to us even at the Department of Homeland Security on the emergency management side of the house. The, that, is there a way for us to rethink those boundaries of the districts? Um, additionally, and uh, Dr. Welsh, I think I heard you mention something on one of the other commission meetings about crossing state lines and issues associated with um, expectations uh, with patients that are, that are moving back and forth. I come from an area where the larger municipality is on the Indiana side. So we typically receive patients from Michigan, from Niles and Edwardsburg, Michigan, maybe even up to St. Joe. But if you go down by Cincinnati, Chicago, or Louisville, the flow of patients goes the opposite direction, right? So I know we, uh, on the EMS side of the house, uh, we do have uh, um, 
uh, we have an agreement with uh, the other states, uh, but that's something that probably needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. And then of course, training and messaging is very difficult to do in districts with individuals that you don't necessarily expect to respond with, right? So long story short, this is something that, pro that we all agreed would, would be something that we'd need to look at. Um, improving and sustaining readiness, um, addressing the lack of local ownership and resources in some areas of the state. Um, some counties still lack a full-time public health preparedness manager and or EMA director. There's one county in the state that doesn't even have an EMA director. And I, I believe there's roughly 20 counties in the state that only have a, a, a part-time EMA director. Now, those positions are funded at the county level right now. And I, I, I believe that that would be the case also for the public health preparedness manager. So those are, that's, that's certainly something that can be addressed. Uh, promote, promoting buy-in and utilize, utilization of EM resource, like we talked about, that's a really tremendous resource for the State Department of Health to be able to utilize, to have situational awareness on how things are being affected in different parts of the state and how they can move their resources around the most efficient uh, way. These last couple of slides I'm gonna point out, uh, this is just a, uh, a recommendation to, to make an attempt to close the urban and rural EMS gap. Um, Dr. Kaufman provided this slide for us. The, the, uh, the example, these are fictional counties, uh, so it's not any, any particular person's county, um, but the one on top represents an urban or suburban county in the state of Indiana with a population of roughly 340,000 with all of those resources. And then the rural county below has a population of 15,000 with many way fewer resources. And ultimately the thing that is important on this slide is the time to definitive care, right? So the time to definitive care in an urban setting, typically in the state of Indiana is gonna be within minutes. I can speak to that. I was a paramedic in South Bend for years, delivering patients to Memorial Hospital, which is a level two trauma center. And oftentimes our response times to, or transport times to the hospital were one or two minutes. Um, I was in a local downtown uh, ambulance. Conversely, if you're in a rural county and you go to Crawford County, I believe there's not a hospital even in the county, much less uh, uh, multiple EMS resources in that county. Uh, if I'm correct, Crawford County only has two uh, full-time uh, ambulances on duty in the county. And if they transport someone to the hospital, they have to go out of the county. So that takes a resource out of the county. So you could imagine how that would then impact a second patient that calls for 911 to get to a hospital, especially if they're in critical condition of some sort and need a cath lab or, or trauma services. So the thing that I want to really point out here as we end this uh, is that all emergencies begin and end on the local level. It's really important that we provide training, exercise, and planning resources to the counties on the local level, but to integrate them with state, state folks and state resources as well. In an emergency that starts in one county or one community, may and probably will expand to impact the district, state, or entire country as we just recently saw. And then in, as Indiana moves forward, we must ensure that our preparedness is scalable, reproducible, and sustainable. So uh, without any further ado, uh, we do have some appendices at the back end of this uh, that speak to EMS uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the trauma, um, resources in the state. Uh, I believe, Shane, we are available now for <laughs> questions and answers. That's right. Now we got Dr. Halverson, I'm sorry, I cut you Dr. off. Sir. Dr. Halverson, you get the first question. <laughs> so thank you very much. I, I guess a few questions. Uh, one in particular, as you talked about uh, on the map that described 92% of the people within one hour to a trauma center. Uh, 45 minutes, 45 I believe, minutes. is the state standard. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. So, um, but the same, it's the same question. It's 45 minutes uh, to any level trauma center. That's that right? correct. So we know that there are patients that 
really don't know or, or really should not go directly to a level three center that when in fact they might need a level one center right so that, the, yes, the idea here is to try to make sure that you match patient need with the resources available so right. to the extent that the patient really needs a level one center and they wind up going to a level three center it, it's nice to be able to know globally but it's really important to be able to match patient need to resources. Wouldn't you agree? I would totally agree with that. Yes, sir. Actually, if I can respond to that, just to let you know, the trauma care committee, which is a meeting tomorrow, by, by the way, um, that's part of the tra uh, tra trauma and tri uh, tr triage and transport rules the EMS has put together. And when a case goes, say, to a level three, and maybe it should have gone to a level two or level one, that's part of the review process done at that uh, hospital system, right. as well as with the State Department of Health. Um, so that is something that is on the radar of the, the Trauma Care Committee and State Department of Health, but you make an excellent point. If, if Dr. Kaufman could also address the commission mm -hmm. on that. Good afternoon. Um, really excited and happy to address that question with regards to where those trauma patients go. So several years ago, the uh, triage and transport rule was passed that requires ambulances to take patients that meet step one or two of the CDC field trauma triage criteria. Those are the more severe trauma injuries to a trauma center, but you are correct in that it doesn't spy, it specify the designation of trauma center level. I've seen and, and recognizing that need um, several years ago, the EMS commission um, tentatively approved uh, an update to that rule that would specify level one versus level two versus level three based on the severity of their injury. Having said that, we've been unable to advance that rule simply because of the promulgation process, some of the hurdles that are involved in doing that, coupled with the pandemic, which has rightfully taken a lot of folks' attention. Um, but I think that illustrates the fact that many of our rules pertaining to emergency response and emergency care need updating and haven't been done in a long time. We're prepared to, to do that as well. And I think that's another opportunity for this committee is to address some of those outdated rules. Mike, can you just expand? Sorry, I, I know I spoke without yeah, using my hand, ahead. but expand just a little bit on the issues of our rural areas and one hospital county or one ambulance county or two ambulance, how going to those other counties, can you talk just a little bit about the issues we ran into with COVID? I, I can, thank you, Dr. Box. Um, so very quickly, if we go back to how our EMS system started, and I'm going to go back 50 years ago, it really started as a way to move patients very quickly from the scene of an accident to a hospital. So the only thing that really mattered back 50 years ago was how fast that ambulance could drive and how close they were to the scene of the accident. Over the next 50 years, the care that is delivered in the out-of-hospital setting has evolved dramatically. We're doing invasive procedures, cardiac monitoring, medications, intravenous therapies, um, but because of those humble beginnings of EMS, EMS is reimbursed as more of a transportation mechanism. So they receive a, a pickup fee and then a per loaded mile fee of reimbursement. It's not based on the amount of care that's rendered. So as such, many EMS systems are funded to just that, a number of miles transported, which really leaves a significant gap in mm -hmm. providing additional resources such as the proper number of ambulances. There are 11 states in the country that define EMS as an essential service, essential public service. Um, Indiana is one of those. However, what's not specified is the amount of funding or the level of readiness that is needed across the state. So as a result, we have some counties with very limited funding to support the entire EMS system. That includes the 911 response as well as the inter-facility transfer response between hospitals. So as such, as Dr. Box mentioned, you have some counties with very limited resources. They may have two ambulances on a good day and one ambulance on a day when they just simply don't have enough personnel to staff both ambulances. So when someone calls 911 and that person needs to go all, to, all the way to Indianapolis or another level one trauma center, that county is then essentially left uncovered. And there are unfortunately many counties in Indiana that fit that same description. Yeah, Dr. King. So you're, you're talking about the ambulances, but I'm worried about how many counties, one, have even a, a hospital. So that, that's the first issue. And then this, and so you're talking about um, the support for that hospital. And then when you're moving patients from one county to another hospital, and let's say they're indigent, they don't have any insurance, who gets stuck with that bill? I'm, my hospital, I'm trying to survive paying the, 
the salaries for the staff in there, but if I keep getting patients from surrounding counties and, no, and those counties are not responsible for paying <coughs> for the bill of that patient that resides in my county, then you have a, you put some hospitals at risk for not even surviving because they're now stuck with the patient bills. I'm not even talking about the ambulances, I'm just talking about the patient bills in terms of um, providing the care. So I think not only from an emergency standpoint, how we strengthen our ambulances, I think we need to look at how are we strengthening our hospital settings, especially if patients are coming from outside their county and we want them to survive. And I would have loved to have seen a map that it highlighted where all the level one hospitals are in the state of Indiana. We have that. We can get that to you. And so can you just tell me just the total number? Um, do we know what that total number? Ma'am, the total number of one? level ones mm -hmm. are four, if I'm not mistaken. It's in the It's, it's, it's in on the, the handout deck. that you just said. How map, many? And the map is not, uh, doesn't go outside of Marion County. You said how, how many level one? There are four plus there one provisional. Four. So can I can I say three of those four no. are they in are three of those four level ones in Marion County? They're all in Marion County, ma'am. I want to rest my case now. Yep. <laughs> all right. So yep. boy, if I'm in Gary, you're trying to get me to a level one. Right. Well, well that's why I, I go to I'll, Chicago. Ma'am, ma I'll, I'll say this. In, in Gary, they would go to Chicago. In South Bend, uh, you're get, hoping for an air, airplane or a helicopter or something. Hmm. Um, I, I would also point out, um, while we're, we're focused on trauma right this moment, this also goes with cardiac patients needing a cath lab, uh, stroke center, and, and the list goes on. Pediatric uh, intensive care units. Uh, and et, et cetera, so. So, and I, I, I see patients out of Askenazi. So I used to get calls from South Bend, mm -hmm. you know, all those other places trying to set uh, patients. So it's um, um, maybe a level two, um, because don't, don't you, for you to be level one, you have to have a research component to be yes. level one and stuff. So, Maybe I've got all the care, but I'm just not doing the research. So we need to look at the level twos too as well. Thank you. Okay, we have a lot of questions. Dr. Max, you, you had your hand up and then we'll move to Dr. Halverson. So to I have Mindy a question Wilson. on, it was slide nine where you were showing the frequency of annual EMS run volume and that it was increasing from substantially from 18 to 2021. Is there a monitoring of the purpose of the run and so I guess what I'm trying to get at is you mentioned at the beginning that EMS runs are the frontline healthcare <laughs> safety net yes. and so I'm wondering are we tracking not just runs but what those runs are for yeah. if that makes sense yes there is a reporting system for EMS agencies to provide information to the state and I believe we have over 90 percent of the EMS agencies in the state report that in, in the type of run call is coded out. I, Dr. Kaufman, if you'd like. So has that distribution changed? Like when we saw this increase, was it, was the, the, was it the same like distribution of trauma and other calls or have we seen changes to that? So generally speaking, and I'm happy to go back and, and pull specific references, the the, the, the problems themselves haven't changed, just the numbers of each of those have continued to go up over the years. Okay, okay, great. And it, we said that we went from approximately 2,000 ambulances down to 1,800, under 1,800. Do we know the reason for that? Is it just that ambulance services have reduced their force? Is it a workforce issue? Is it's it all a combination of workforce issues and uh, so personnel shortages and, and quite simply funding. Reimbursement. Reimbursement, absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. We've had several providers in the state uh, that are no longer in business is, is one of the issues. And that relates directly back to funding. Oftentimes you'll find that municipal EMS provided like like Indianapolis EMS, South Bend Fire Department, um, Elkhart Fire Department, they're somewhat subsidized by their local municipality, but the private uh, EMS providers don't have that luxury. And so they rely very heavily on doing transport service between facilities. And as Dr. Kaufman mentioned, oftentimes that's reimbursed 
on a mileage rate versus the service that's provided. And that becomes a big problem when you're, when you're paying for training uh, in, in personnel uh, for, for those services. Okay, Dr. Halverson. <laughs> I think this whole row here. So Dr. Halverson. Let me just yeah, ask a, a, a follow-up question on the on the trauma before we get into preparedness. Uh, when was the last time there was a comprehensive review done of the state's trauma system point. to look at both pre-hospital, hospital, and uh, a, you know post-acute care? The whole enchilada. Sir, I believe that's actually ongoing system. right now. Am I correct on that, Dr. Box? Dr. Box, do you want to answer that question? So um, it, it's, it's ongoing. Um, the, the biggest comprehensive uh, process was done with consultation with Mary College of Surgeons. It's been a number of years ago that is actually a point of discussion in the Trauma Care Committee to see if, if we cannot arrange for an additional consultation update of where we're at and where, where we need to go yet. Well, that, that was the reason for my question, actually, Dr. Welsh, because having been a state health officer in another state, we actually had a very comprehensive review done with the consultation of ACS, and it was uh, extremely valuable. And if it hasn't been done in the last five years, I would suggest that there's a lot of opportunities for um, improvement. And I, I think, again, having seen other states' trauma systems, I would suggest that we have several substantial deficiencies in our state trauma system that really do require um, immediate attention and some that are longer term issues, all of which I think would really have an impact on the survivability of the leading cause of death in our state. So I, I think it's something that this commission needs to take seriously in terms of the deficiencies not to say that everything is wrong, but there's a lot of things that could be better. And I think you'd agree with that. Yes, sir. And I'll be happy to pass that on. And the chairperson for our trauma care committee is in the room, Dr. Weaver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. We're just going to move down this row. So, Mindy, you're next. Okay. Um, thank you for all the information. Really, sure. really good to hear. It's not something I deal with every day. So it was, it was very helpful to fill in the rest of that pie. I was wondering, uh, some of my questions might be Megan answers, but I was sort of wondering along the local preparedness side of things, if we have data, wishes, needs, um, numbers. So who has what in all the localities, what money we spend on that, that sort of thing. So, cause I, I assume when we get to the planning stage for this committee, that we would probably be looking for things for that too. Do we have any baseline denominator information on local public health for Megan, Megan, you want to address it? Do you know? Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me as well. Um, yes, Mindy, we have that breakdown for sure um, that we provide via the FEP agreement, the mm -hmm. Public Health Emergency Preparedness Agreement annually um, to local health departments. And then we also can provide the breakdown that we um, give to the HCCs, the healthcare coalitions throughout the state or attend them aligned with all the districts and we can certainly provide that. High level in the last three years, we have provided $25,000 to each local health department participating in the FEP agreement to help support at least a 50% um, FTE for um, public health preparedness. Follow up, just yeah. real quick. Sure. I think, because I know I'm, I'm not uh, at all trying to be critical. My hope is I'm sure there's needs in that realm, right? So at, from the state aspect to the local aspect, um, this seemed focused on not local health department preparedness or the, the gaps that we have. So I wonder if we have any discussion points that we want to get to in, in the next few meetings about that, because that seems to be one large component to this, right? So I was just wondering if maybe we, we could talk about that a little bit and see if there are wishes and dreams along that line. I know we all have them as local health departments. So I just wondered if we'd had some baseline info we could build from that to maybe help. I think if you would delineate the baseline info that you would like to see or have as a local health department, if we've got it, we'll be glad to put it together for this okay. commission. Okay, that'd be cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, go to the EMS response. You talked about yes, limitations sir. in rural areas. Um, do you have a rough ballpark when, when they average time they spend on scene? I know what it is for the trauma patients, but I mean, right. these other. Uh, I, I don't, I, I think that we might be able to, to 
I'm just taking provide that at a later time if we could and connect with that is with the manpower uh, or person power shortage that we're dealing with. You have a rough idea of the average age of our EMT paramedics. Uh, I, I yeah, we can get that for and you, I Doctor. That might be I, helpful to the commission yeah. because um, we're, one of the areas we're looking sure. at is workforce. And one last thing, um, yes, as you're doing the preparation, I, I know what it is for me locally on the on the planning and preparedness. Um, how responsive are your local entities to the EMA or the, the emergency planning, the local hospitals, local uh, you know agencies of the city or county? Just how, how much cooperation are you getting? So that's a great question. Uh, I, I don't know if I could adequately quantify that um, other than that I would say in different areas or regions of the state, it's different. You have a uh, very, very solid participation in certain parts of the state as opposed to others. Um, and it's not always the same participation. Um, in some areas, the HCC might be incredibly active, but on the, EM, uh, on the EMA side of the house, it's, it's not so. Um, I, I would say for the most part, um, we have participation in every district of the state right now. We, uh, our agency goes out and um, we, uh, we have quarterly meetings with the EMA directors in every, every district. Um, and for the most part, we have decent participation. I would say some counties, though, have not made that a priority. And so in a county that only has a part-time person working as an EMA director uh, and has to have another job, sometimes it's difficult for them to get to those district meetings or to even communicate with us at the state level uh, or to participate in training or otherwise. So that's, one of the, that's, that's certainly a shortfall. Uh, uh, within the state in certain areas. As a, as a county health officer for two, I really appreciate the help that your group has made sure. to my area. And um, so the group knows whenever we've got a question, concern, or problem, um, they're always ready, willing to try to help us any way they, they can. Thank you. That's their facilitators. That's how I look at them. That's their job to get stuff done. So absolutely. That's great. Okay, Dr. Neal. So uh, my question might not get answered today because it might be a much longer response than, than we have time for, but um, going to the funding and, and Dr. Kaufman and I've had a lot of conversations about how EMS is funded. Um, I just, maybe if you could help me understand fire and EMS both respond or both report underneath the Department of Homeland Security. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, but when we look at fire, they're not paid based on a fire, responding to a fire. They sure. get funding to be there available and ready. Right. So is, is there a reason or, or maybe is there a history about the differences in the funding pertaining to fire response and EMS? Or? So I, I think there, yeah. you may have a little bit of a misunderstanding of that. So that, yeah, and, no, that's okay. Um, so there isn't mandated uh, funding for fire service in anywhere in the state. So if a municipality uh, is a municipality, they do have a requirement to fund the fire department as an entity providing emergency services typically, but especially in township areas or unincorporated areas, that's not so. And that's where, as I believe Congresswoman Brooks brought up, you have infinitely more uh, volunteer services in the state of Indiana than you do uh, paid career departments in the fire service, uh, hundreds more. And I believe there's only 849 fire departments in the state. And I would probably guess that there's less than 200 that are career departments. Okay. Um, and now, typically speaking, I would also say that uh, most all of the fire departments in the state of Indiana respond as first responders to EMS incidents and have EMS trained personnel, specifically the career departments, um, in, in multiple municipalities around the state, we have ALS engine companies that will respond um, and provide ALS care from, uh, you know, from the moment they, they have patient contact. Um, and so those are, those are, again, paid departments that have resources and are typically municipally funded or sometimes county funded. A fire territory is another way you can provide funding and a tax base to support a local fire department. And in those areas, oftentimes they 
also fund the ambulance service through the fire department. Okay, still all local though. All, all local, local. Okay. all local. Uh, the, the state right now, we provide some amount of funding. It's more or less in grants to provide some infrastructure money, some equipment money uh, and training money and additional training resources for locals, uh, both on the EMS and fire side right now, but there's not a, uh, a mandate for the state to actually fund or, or even a municipality or a county to fund an ambulance service. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna... Kim, oh. <laughs> Carl, oh, oh, I'm sorry, no, you're still I'm, sorry. Row. I'm still working on this row. <laughs> sorry, Carl, you're up. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I can just, I, just anecdotally, and we can certainly get some numbers to the commission uh, to provide you uh, the, the numbers, both in the fire service and the EMS side. Um, anecdotally, I would tell you that the fire service, when I uh, initially got into the fire department in 93, uh, regularly, they would just say, we're just putting a sign out in front of the fire station, we're hiring, and 400 people would show up to take the test, and it was extremely competitive. Right now, I was in, in a, a city yesterday with the governor and the fire chief told us he had two individuals for three openings at his department and he has no idea where he's gonna get that third person to even apply. They haven't even done any background checks or anything, that's just applications. So it's, 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 I think it's a, it's a larger problem just with employment in general because I know even in our agency, which isn't just fire and EMS, uh, we're having trouble getting applicants into uh, our agency as well. So there's a there's a there's a more global problem, but then within the emergency services, there's an even greater additional problem. I think there's a problem in the state of Indiana. Yes, ma'am. We have not kept up with our salaries for critical <laughs> positions. Inflation is hitting us, and with these gas prices and foods, you know, you you can't update people's salaries like. 10 years ago, inspect to remain competitive. And I know that's our problem in Indianapolis. We've got to raise the salaries. I would say yes. I just wanted to put a couple numbers to your question. And I do want to give special thanks to the Bowen Center who helped us with a workforce study not that long ago. So in 2018, we had just over 4,900 paramedics and 14,000 EMTs. And at that time, our run volume annually was about 750,000. Last year, we had 4,600 paramedics and 13,000 EMTs with 1.25 million patient responses with 200 fewer ambulances. Mm -hmm. So the workforce is declining and more in recent days. Mm -hmm. The one thing we don't have good knowledge on is how many of those individuals that are certified or licensed are actually practicing or using their, cer their certification or license. The average wage for an EMS professional is somewhere in the mid $15 per hour range. That's right, so many of our EMS professionals can now go out and get an unskilled labor job at an Amazon or a Walmart and make more than they can after going to school for 18 months and learning how to save a patient's life, so. If, if I could add on top of that, I, I'm sorry, we're just tag teaming here, but the other thing that, that you're starting to see is the exact same thing that's happening in the hospitals with burnout. Yeah. So as you wind up going, so if I work as a paramedic in South Bend and I go out, uh, you know, four years ago on per shift, you know, 12 calls, I may be going out on 15 calls now and I'm getting to Dr. Kane's point, mm -hmm. the same pay, same benefits and everything else. I'm just going on more calls. And as we all know, in, in dealing with uh, EMS or emergency services, Oftentimes there's a PTSD component, there's a lack of sleep component, the list goes on. And so ultimately we see more individuals leaving the fire service. Whereas, uh, you know, years ago when I first got in, it was the best job. Well, it's still the best job on the planet. Dr. Box has heard me say it a million times. Being a firefighter is the best job on the planet. I'll say it again. Uh, but, but in the end, you're seeing people who would have normally 30 years ago stay for a 30 year career 
they're leaving after three and four years because they think, you, to Dr. Dr. Kaufman's point, they'd rather go get a, a factory job that they're going to make more money at and not have all of the risk associated, not have the, the mental health issues associated, et cetera. And sometimes, uh, you know, they, it, you know, there's there are a lot of other problems inherent to emergency services uh, with substance abuse, um, divorce, all kinds of different issues. And, and so a lot of, especially younger folks getting into the profession right now are oftentimes looking at that and thinking, I, I don't know if I wanna go through all of that over 30 years. Instead, I'm gonna just go work at the bike shop and put together bikes for 20 bucks an hour and still make about the same money and not have all that behind me. Wow. Okay, we're going to go to this row. <laughs> so, Kim, Kim okay. we'll start with uh, Kim Orwin and then we'll work our way down the road. Sure. I have three topics which may or may not be answerable, so I'll read them and then you can decide All what good. to say. First is we're just regarding staffing within Homeland Security and yes, the Division of Emergency Preparedness. And I'm not clear on the split of that, but I, I think I've heard that compared to 10, 12 years ago, we have significantly less people at the state level working. And so that's just one question. Okay. I'm curious why and that. For the sure. second is I'm very generally aware of like what I think is community paramedicine where we do have EMTs going in and working on more primary secondary prevention type things. And I'm curious the role of that through um, your areas and, and kind of the opportunity for more of that across the state. And then the third thing putting on my health by design hat is um, just, you know, we know that decisions made at INDOT around roadway engineering and speed and all of those things contribute significantly to this emergency response. We know transportation funding through FSSA and non-emergency medical transportation, facility transfers, all of that, like it all matters. And so I just would be curious, kind of that health and all policies, interdepartmental approach to address, trying to prevent some of the back end things that you all have to deal with. Sure. Can I, Probably can't get to all of that here, but I actually, if I could, uh, I could address questions one and three uh, uh, relatively quickly, and then I'm going to turn it over to the state uh, expert in community paramedicine, which is standing right there. So, um, so the number of EM uh, emergency management staff at IDHS has really not changed over the course of the last ten to twelve years. I know Congresswoman Brooks brought up the fact that uh, homeland security as a discipline is very young, right? And if uh, those of you that remember, I recall because I was in a car listening to the president talk right after 9-11 happened, maybe, maybe two days later when he announced that he was creating the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. in, a, in an address before Congress. So as, as Congresswoman Brooks brought up, it's only 20 years old. Yeah. So um, and the state agency was only created in 20, 2005. So um, we have built out our uh, emergency management section. We run the state EOC. We have uh, a planning section, exercise sections, et cetera. And the only, the only thing that has impacted our, the number of employees that we have working within the state uh, agency has been COVID because there was a, a hiring freeze for a period of time in 2020. And we have begun to rehire for those positions now, and we've been filling them. So at this point, uh, our, our uh, section of the agency has been uh, working full time as they were pre-COVID. Um, your third question, that is a fascinating question is probably going to need an incredibly detailed answer. Um, I would just tell you as a fire chief, one of the questions I was always asked about, and anybody in here that lives in Carmel knows about roundabouts, right? <laughs> Uh, and all this, all this argument about roundabouts. Well, South Bend, shortly after Carmel started building them, we started building them. And of course, it, there was a public outcry and everybody was yelling and screaming. And I had a guy show up in my office telling me how you can't, you can't build roundabouts and all that. And I explained to him, I'm just going to tell you from a public safety perspective, um, we don't respond to those corners any, anymore with fatal accidents. Yeah. So yeah. as far as I'm concerned, I love roundabouts. I think they're the best thing that ever happened. Sure, if you have some fender benders, that, that, that's terrible, but you're probably going to have those at, at the T or at the, yeah. the regular intersection anyway. 
And now you, the roundabout has eliminated those high impact accidents typically. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they still happen occasionally, but, but it, it's way fewer. Uh, that's the only thing that I that just comes right to mind, uh, just because of the whole roundabout discussion. But uh, certainly, we can get back to you, and I can I can touch base with our, our partners at INDOT to maybe give the commission some information in regards to that. Sure, and honestly, I would be happy to bring forth recommendations to from That'd the work that we do. So that'd be phenomenal. Or I would love to be in those conversations. Sure, so. absolutely. And with regards to interagency action on this, working with FSSA, Department of Homeland Security, IDOH that is occurring and all those discussions are taking place. Yeah. So thank you, Kim, for bringing that up. Absolutely. And, and uh, we are huge proponents of the community paramedicine program. Uh, I started one in South Bend at my department. I know there uh, is one in Crawfordsville. They're, they're popping up everywhere right now. And I, I, if I could, if, if Dr. Kaufman could just briefly explain that. Thank you very quickly. Um, for one minute primer on community paramedicine. So in 1996, uh, EMS leaders from around the country got together and they had this thought. Um, we have hundreds of thousands well-trained, highly educated, badged, uniformed, mobile resources, professionals waiting right now for someone to fall and break their leg or have a heart attack or get into a trauma. Why not work proactively and send these members out into communities, high-risk communities, to keep people healthy, to prevent disease, to educate on wellness. Um, that is the concept of community paramedicine. And here we are 26 years later, and we've not fully realized what that is or how to implement that. Um, remember that adding more community paramedicine programs was one of Governor Helcom's public health pillars back in 2019, 2020, in that time frame. Um, the, the, the hurdle, the obstacle is that because EMS is still regarded as a transportation benefit, they can't get reimbursed for these programs because it's typically on scene care, not in an emergency setting, but more in a, in a way to, to keep people well and healthy. So right now, the programs that are starting up, and we do have more than a dozen of those in the state, are being funded through wonderful initiatives such, um, such as like through the Department of Health and Dr. Box has been a huge proponent of community paramedicine. Um, other programs are being funded from, so most of them are now cost avoidance or cost savings programs. So some of the healthcare systems are starting to recognize this and contribute some funding. So thanks to the hospitals in that regard. Another hurdle though, is just simply that we don't have the people to do it because they're busy now caring for 1.26 million emergency calls per year. And those same ambulances are tied up doing interfacility transfers between the hospitals of those patients um, because we don't have enough resources for the non-emergent patients such as Medicare, Medicare cabs and, uh, and, and, and wheelchair vans and those sorts of things. So big need, lots of potential and opportunity to truly impact public health and healthcare using community paramedicine. Uh, well, uh, I would be remiss if I just didn't start by thanking the, sure. the commissioner, Dr. Kaufman and Megan for all the support of hospitals uh, during the, the last couple of years. Uh, and of course it's ongoing and I'm sure there'll be other challenges, but thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks to the whole team. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, Kim community paramedicine because I think it, because of the, ex, the excellent uh, primer there, um, we do need to think about this in not, not just in terms of responding to those emergencies and within the trauma system, but for, for us to meet the needs of some of our rural areas to address infant maternal mortality, community paramedicine uh, is the future, I, I think, in many respects. It's, it's where we're going to be able to meet that need for those interventions where there isn't a delivering hospital in the community, uh, doing those wellness checks. I I'm probably would leave some out, but I, Hendricks County, Hendricks Regional Health is a fantastic program, and Hendricks, uh, I know the Franciscan Alliance has deployed this specifically uh, in the Crawfordsville area, which is kind of a national model, right. I think, it that's is. been recognized. Um, so we do need to grow that, but it, it, there's so much potential, but it's built on this sort of fragile underpinning right now because right. of the workforce issue. So um, when we talk about workforce, definitely think we need to talk about community paramedicine or paramedicine and how we support that. Um, my question was going way back to something that the national strategic stockpile. Uh, so when we you know, worked uh, kind of at the outset of the, the pandemic, um, I know that that obviously it's terrific to have, um, but, but it, do we have any kind of 
add-ons to that? You know, I mean, is that part of the after action report? If we were to look back and is that something Indiana should be thinking of investing in? I, Megan's on, working. <laughs> and stepped into the on deck circle there. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, because I, I, I do feel like there's incredible partnerships, but I think we together had some of the same struggles early on. Um, so I don't know, any thoughts about a state strategic stockpile, how we sort of add to that? Absolutely, um, a lot of lessons learned yeah. from the strategic national stockpile. And um, moving forward, Dr. Box very early on in the response um, made it clear to me and my staff that we will never be here again, right? <laughs> so, it's, um, and, and all the funding and everything that's been talked about since 9-11 um, got us to where we were and where we thought we were ready and prepared. Um, but again, lessons learned. So what we have done throughout the response is identify the things that we know we have to have in a um, pandemic response like this to take care of a minimum number of Hoosiers. And we have set those things aside, if you will, um, and they're not physically set aside, but in our inventories to ensure that we have those moving forward and those items of PPE. The other thing that we talk about, we, we have learned from the H1N1 response and the SNS is we all had a lot of things, but a lot of those things expired. And so one of the goals of, um, of our division moving forward is that in the um, stock that we have right now, that we work with hospitals, we work with health departments, we work with other healthcare providers, um, and hopefully a partner that can help us um, integrate life cycle management into um, the Hoosier SNS, if you will. We don't have an official name yet, but to make sure that we not only have the things, but they are ready to be deployed. And the funding for that is, is critical because um, our FEP and our HPP funding uh, is what it is. And it's, it's being main, maintained from what I hear. I, I don't know for sure, but I know that we're working on our application. It's our internal deadline is today. Saying, um, but uh, it it does not cover a Hoosier SNS, and um, it is something that we hope to be able to sustain. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah. Okay. My questions probably will go this way and that way. Um, I heard as we were talking about the EMS funding um, limiting to travel expense. I heard a very subtle plea for funding as we're talking about the preparedness umbrella, the, the component of all this, do funds get bolstered? Maybe uh, we talked about how we want some public health nurses or other public employees to have base salaries or we're supporting, do we tie in EMS into that component of what we're doing or does that fall under uh, Homeland Security in a, in a different budget? So I, I think that it's part of the recommendations to the governor and they can decide that I, I think our legislators would decide how to do that. A big part of that might be Medicaid funding for that purpose. And then oftentimes the other funding follows with that from an EMS standpoint. Um, kind of another infrastructure question or structure. Um, as I was looking through the slide presentation early, try, try and do that. Um, Flag came, came up and, and uh, early on for District 6, I was very instrumental in helping get our DPOC together. Um, that's kind of been laid to the wayside. A lot of DPOCs I understand aren't working. Um, are we revitalizing that concept? And can we add maybe the uh, public, uh, public health component into the DPOC to help the executives actually make better decisions? The answer to that is yes and yes. Um, we can, we can, uh, uh, so one, so the, as I mentioned, I think one of the questions over here was um, the, how, um, how robust the participation is in different districts within the state. And um, uh, district six, I would say is probably one of the more active districts. Um, and so uh, believe it or not. And so, but you may also see other districts um, that, that participate just as much. I, I, having said that, it's not the same everywhere. Let's just say that, okay? Um, so right now, our uh, agency is actually working with the different districts. We have liaisons that, that work with the districts directly to help build these uh, programs out and everything. So certainly that's something that we, we're working on. 
Yes, please. Um, our HPV grant that funds the healthcare coalitions, that's the ASPR grant that Director Fox spoke of, it requires that we have an EMA, two hospitals, local health department, and EMS, one, um, and two hospitals. One each, two hospitals. Um, and when they changed that at the federal level and mandated that requirement, we talked early on about combining the DPCs and the HCCs. And um, I think it's something that if you all could consider, I, I would I would recommend us looking into. And the other thing, while I, while I have the opportunity, is we have the HCCs, we have the DPCs, and we have a lot of district level planning. Um, and through the COVID nineteen response, what we found is. There's really no authority. There's no, they're, they're being tasked with coordinating and planning and training and working together. But when it comes down to it, they don't have any authority to, to make any decisions or any, any requests even. Um, so. Just an example of that would be if a, a grant was going to come to a, a district, uh, one of the counties actually had to sign off on that particular one representing all, all the districts. And so there wasn't really a central command and control, so to speak. Which is where regionalization of that and truly putting that decision-making and signing for that at a regional type level would be even better. I will say, and this is, I told um, Judy that I had a comment I wanted to make throughout this pandemic, we did not work much with EMAs or with our healthcare coalitions. And, and when this first started, when the pendulum swung in the federal government and they said, we need healthcare coalitions and they have to include all these different people, we did a roadshow to all 10 districts, the then uh, Department of Homeland Security and myself and our teams went out and we gathered these individuals together and said, this is a team. You have to work as a preparedness team. We went through all of this. We went through the, the health side of it. We went through the DHS side of it. And I don't know that it really helped. So I, I, I don't know. This goes by the way of the funding federally, how it comes down and they dictate how this has to be organized. But we do have to answer. And that was going to be my question to you guys. Did the two of you get together and figure out how we could make this one functioning preparedness unit for each of our areas, our districts? Maybe that's one of the recommendations out of here. <laughs> without a doubt. I don't know if the two of us need to be the ones doing it, but that certainly seems like a logical conclusion to this. I would also mention, sir, is it, um, uh, as I mentioned, one of our recommendations is executive level buy-in. And uh, as, as Megan mentioned, in each of the HCCs, a requirement is to have one of the county commissioners and the mayor of the larger city in, in, involved in, uh, in the district. And oftentimes that participation is not happening. So that's a DPOC. Yeah, DPOC. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's, I'm there's three things, DPOC, DPOC, and ACC. Senator Kinley has come. You know, <clears throat> you, you brought this report to this forum and you're sort of suggesting, well, why don't you make this part of your report because it would help the situation cross agency and other things too. Now that you've talked to us, maybe you could go back on some, I mean, there are hints throughout this thing about that. Maybe you could go back and make just a few key recommendations that you think might be of value for us to include in the report that might benefit both us and your organization okay so so if you wouldn't mind doing a little more work and getting back to dr box and shane i think that might be of fruitfulness because we're we're buying your comments but we probably don't have enough expertise to articulate this without trying to pick through the report figured out and along those lines on page 25 you say reconsider the current idoh district boundaries but you don't say or make any suggestion about how you would do that and maybe that's not a doable thing but i would it hit me when i looked at that and i just thought if you have some suggestion for us maybe you should articulate that I think that that probably is going to require some significant study to make sure that we could be uh, we do this in a in, in a smart way because I I, I think there, there's a lot going on there to create yeah. some, a product that that actually 
gives everybody what they need in I, different I think districts. That's right. And I don't think I have a clue how to go back <laughs> and look at it. Uh, but you're suggesting it along with some yes. other things. And I'm so I'm, sure now that you've been here, let's get it down to five or six things you think maybe you have a chance to advance the ball with and bring us some uh, uh, pros back that says, here's what we think. We're happy to do that, sir. All right. Congresswoman Brooks and Ward Down. Why okay. don't you go with go them? Okay, you okay with that? All right, we'll continue. Sure. Yep. Okay. Uh, I just want to make an observation, uh, Dr. Cox. Thank you because I know you've been to Madison before, and the city of Madison. Um, you know, while we were trying to recover from the pandemic, we also had a natural disaster last summer that created millions of dollars of damage and, and displaced hundreds of of people from uh, flooding in the interior of the city of Madison in the historic district, and so. Uh, the communication with IDHS on that side of things and IDOH with regard to the pandemic, nothing short of impressive. So I want to thank both of these organizations. The communication with you all, frankly, was uh, much better than even the communication we were, we were trying to organize at the local level. The nexus I want to create or, or suggest here is that our funding at the local level for emergency preparedness is even more anemic than our funding for uh, public health. <laughs> and so both of those, I think it is timely that we're talking about emergency preparedness in, in the context of you know, preparing for uh, and investing in, in public health. And then as we move into the stage of governance and talking about, well, how can we be better prepared, uh, at least at the emergency preparedness level at the county, at, at the county uh, the, the executives of the largest municipalities you mentioned earlier is participating with county executives into uh, creating the strategic plan for emergency preparedness. That doesn't happen on the public health side of things because the city of Madison is a third class city and we do not have a direct representation on the local uh, health board uh, like we do the emergency uh, management agency. And so I think that these similarities, there are some takeaways from both that we can uh, share and incorporate, and there is definitely a connection between emergency preparedness and public health investment. And when we were discussing the um, foundational um, aspects of a public health board, that came up, that we needed to change the representation around to include major cities in that area on that health board too. And, and that was because you had spoken with me about that. And I was like, that is a really good idea. So it is part of, I know what Pam's team has been looking at too. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Cox. Mm -hmm. Very good Com comment. This is not a question, but a comment. Um, and thank you and all of you for the comments. But so out in Hendricks County, <clears throat> we are currently involved in trying to establish a new fire territory. And it, so there's fire districts, fire territory, fire departments, and they're all different. The fire territory is in a location uh, in a township that is uh, heavily uh, being built by these uh, big box uh, developers that are putting in um, 500,000 million square foot buildings. Uh, and as we develop the, trying to develop the fire territory, the public in that area are saying, uh, you know, why do we have to be the ones paying for all of this when these big boxes are coming in, these developers are coming in, putting in all of this uh, mm -hmm. from the standpoint of building these buildings. They have employees in those buildings. They're primarily in TIF district, which uh, Senator Kenley will understand. Uh, and so on. So to a certain extent, uh, they may not be initially paying their fair share and the public is to a certain extent up in arms. Uh, and this is in a major county in the state, third fastest growing county in the state, uh, in an area that is served by volunteer fire department. Uh, and probably 60, 70% of the runs from that current volunteer fire department are to the location of where these big boxes are located and they're not putting out fires. They're basically emergency medical runs 
uh, for people who are staffing these buildings uh, and so on. So that's just a dilemma that I think exists uh, in our location in Hendricks County. It's probably greater than that. We did have legislation introduced in the current legislative session that passed, thankfully, we'll probably have to go back, that deals with TIFs and how to get some money from the TIF that can help from a fire territory standpoint to pay for some of the uh, development of a fire territory and so forth, but uh, we're gonna have to do more. So uh, it's more of a comment, I guess, that I want, because I'm involved in the middle of this with upset, you know, you've got a, a farmer that owns 3000 acres of land and his tax rate's going to go up dramatically uh, to help pay for this new fire territory. Yeah. And the the fire de the current volunteer fire service isn't doing anything for him at the moment. Now, if he has a heart attack on his tractor, he yeah. wants them to respond. <laughs> but at the same time, that's not happening often. So, FYI. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Actually, my question really feeds off of what you just brought up. And if you could give us examples of public-private partnerships, you mentioned that mm -hmm. as something we should maybe be focusing on. And I just think about the big logistics mm -hmm. warehouse that went up in flames yesterday. Uh, and In Hendricks County. In Hendricks County. And, and, I read, and the 180 firefighters to 220 who responded. Yeah. Um, and so, but what are, and maybe you can, uh, when you give us your five or six ideas, um, give us ideas of public private partnerships that we ought to be exploring, um, relative to helping with some of these issues. Absolutely. And incentives or ideas or places you've seen it working mm -hmm. in other States. We'd love to learn more about that. Absolutely. Man. Thanks. So we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Dr. Howerson, comments? Thank you. And I just was wondering, and thank, thank you so much for all you're doing. Now, kind of wearing the Homeland Security hat more than the emergency management. Um, could you talk a little bit about the planning and training and execution around the coordination of resources? In particular, I was interested in how you coordinate um, both the uh, health the National Guard, uh, state police, um, the federal assets and the FBI and, and your office to sort of come together uh, in, in so many of the aspects related to emergency planning, uh, rely on the, on the well uh, integration of those issues. Could you talk a little bit about Absolutely. that? And in particular, how has public health been helpful or not in the overall um, execution of that integrated strategy? Sure, so, so when we talk about emergency management planning specifically, what we do is we, we utilize an all hazards approach. So we don't necessarily say, okay, we're just focused on one particular type of emergency, right? So we create what's called a, a threat hazard assessment and so basically we, we identify things that uh, different parts of the state have identified as high risk for their specific area. Our planners within our agency then work with locals to be able to build out planning uh, to address those risks. And then on top of that, then we have an exercise division and a training division that then work with those parts of the state, whether it be districts or regions of the state to be able to provide actual exercises and things to be able to, to, to go through them. So a prime example of this is that um, uh, this year, we have a North, Central and South exercise that, that will be taking place. We integrate uh, all of our partners from the National Guard, et cetera. And I, the prime example I'll give you um, is uh, uh, just a couple of months ago, we had a cybersecurity exercise with folks up in the Fort Wayne area. The emergency management was involved. We actually had local utilities involved, some of the healthcare folks, et cetera. Uh, but the National Guard was also involved in that exercise. 
with the, the downside for us and those, uh, the, the thing that limits us in being able to do those kind of exercises or perform those exercises is usually we, we perform those in person. It's just because of COVID, we started doing some of them more remote. And in this particular situation, we did it as a remote exercise, but we're trying to get back in person. And so when you do that, there's a cost associated with it. So ultimately we apply to, to FEMA or to CISA. And in, in this situation, we received a grant from CISA to be able to have CISA build the exercise out for us. Our emergency planners work with them to actually figure out the right stakeholders that we're gonna participate and then ultimately follow through with the planning pieces to the exercise and then the exercise itself and then the after action review with recommendations then based on whatever the outcomes of, of the exercise were. So that's just kind of a broad overview of how it would work. Um, but I would tell you this, that there is limited funding and it's very competitive it, with the federal government to be able to acquire those funds to perform those exercises. And I, I can't overstate, I, Dr. Box has probably heard me a thousand times talk about cybersecurity problems. And I don't think any of us need to go any further than the nightly news about problems there. Um, so you imagine the risk associated with that um, uh, uh, is, is phenomenal. And so we're trying every day to, to work with our partners uh, throughout the state to plan for that. But then additionally, um, I, I wanna say the Southern part of the state is also doing a cyber exercise this year, but later in the year. And, and that works well in a larger county right. where that's oftentimes those individuals full-time jobs. So they can take that right. day and do that. Yeah. You get into the smaller counties and that's just a small portion of what that EMA right. does. And they have a full-time job, you know, Monday through Friday. It's incredibly difficult to get the right people to the table that day to be able to make sure everybody's covered. So that's a, a good yeah. question. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Comments, questions, been a very robust discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Monroe. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, um, several folks have referred to me as Dr. Cox. I am absolutely not a doctor. <laughs> There's a lot of doctors around the room. Dr. Weaver and I looked at each other the first time it was mentioned because it said all the time, director, doctor, it's, <laughs> So it's a title. Uh, my mom called me Steve. So that's that's where I'm. So thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, just mentioning the big fire yesterday, 